Okay, so now um, I'm loving seeing people in person, so thank you all for coming. Um, it's so exciting. I am Heather Bandari, adjunct lecturer in visual arts, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second visual arts lecture of 2022 and the fifth of the 2021-2022 school year. This evening, I am thrilled to introduce you to Kambui Olajimi. Before we go any further, I would like to begin with a living land acknowledgement. Brown University is built on what is now called College Hill, which is part of the unceded ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Nation. Indigenous people from many nations near and far live, study, and work in Providence today. The amplification of native voices and histories is crucial to rectifying the many violent legacies of colonialism, and we gratefully acknowledge the ongoing critical contributions of indigenous people within the university and across the state, region, and country. In addition, I would like to acknowledge that we're connected by a campus that relied on the African slave trade, slave trade in the Americas, and that there are buildings on campus constructed by enslaved people. These acknowledgments and much more commit us to a lifetime of decolonial and anti-racist work. So I'd like to thank Leslie Bostrom, uh, the Chair of Visual Arts, Christine Dodd, Winnie Geyer, CJ Liu, Paul, Connor, and Media Services for facilitating this evening's event. A couple of things to note. First, we kindly ask that you refrain from recording the event. We're gonna take care of that and the video will be archived on the Visual Art website. Um, if you take stills, you can take photos. If you take stills, please tag at Brown Visual Art and at Kambui Olajimi. Second, after Kambui's presentation, there will be Q&A. So there, are, there will be two microphones, one over there and one will be pulled out over here. So when he finishes, just walk on up and ask your questions. Um, just please keep your masks on. And now, finally, I get to welcome Kambui. Um, I am such a big fan, so this is particularly exciting for me. I followed his work for quite some time, but when I saw him in interviews and then finally met him in person, the kindness and warmth that exudes from him is pretty undeniable. Um, he's an incredible artist, thinker, and human being who cares passionately about art, social justice, joy, and his community in equal measure. More formally, Kambui Olajimi was born and raised in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, and received his MFA from Columbia University in New York City. Olajimi's work challenges established modes of thinking that commonly function as, quote, inevitabilities. This pursuit takes shape through interdisciplinary bodies of work spanning sculpture, installation, photography, writing, video, and performance. His solo exhibitions include Zulu Time at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art, A Life in Pictures at MIT Liss Visual Art Center, Solostalgia at Q Arts Foundation, and Wayward North at Art in General. Just this year, he was awarded a substantial Mellon Grant, congratulations, for the completion of his project, North Star Meditations on Weightlessness. And he was named by Art News via Hank Willis Thomas as one of the 12 most underrated artists living or dead. And I'm gonna give you the quote that Hank said. Quote, Kambuyo Olajimi is one of my biggest inspirations in life and work. He's also a sincere person with a beautiful soul who translates a life lived in alignment with his diverse creative practice. So everyone, please uh, join me in welcoming Kambui. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Nice. Um, thank you for bringing me out today. Thank you, Brown University. Thank you, Hello. And thank you all for coming out in, uh, in the snow. Is it snowing now or is it raining now? It's kind of the whole, the whole bundle, <laughs> the wintry mix. Um, yeah, we're going to talk, uh, hopefully this will be fun. We're going to talk about a lot of different things, um, different projects. One of the things I wanted to touch on was the way, like kind of how the sausage gets made. We think in school a lot, you have this idea, you make this piece. But then there's all this like little things, like how are you gonna get it from point A to point B? What happens when you think point A to point B is your, uh, is your route, but in fact, you have like 30 stops in between, and then when you get there, B is somewhere else. So we'll, we'll meander through. Meandering and getting lost, I think, is really important, and I, I, I talk about play a lot in my work, and so uh, let's get it. Um, 
So in 2015, I was working on a project called Zulu Time. And Zulu Time is um, universal coordinated time. And so like if, you, if everyone pulls out there like Apple Watch, it would probably say the exact same time. And there's a way in which we globally have decided to synchronize time and, and it's enforced. So time for me has always been a kind of inevitability in terms of it being a projection of power. And so this work looks to interrupt or show ways in which there are all these other alternate time modalities that are happening, whether it's experiential, you know, like uh, when you're at somebody else's graduation and you're in the sun, time might move real slow, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> my nephew is here, and I was not talking about his graduation, but he looked at me as though I was. Um, and then there are times when you just can't get enough time, you know, like you, it's like every second is just zipping away. So um, Zulu time was at, the, started at the um, Madison Museum of Art and traveled for over two years. When I came up with the idea for what I wanted it to look like, I started and I was maybe two months into production, maybe even three months, and then the 45th president was elected and it just didn't seem like I could make that work, work. I couldn't make the work work, so I just trashed the whole show and I began making new work for this, uh, this project. Um, there's a few elements, uh, let's see, I have my little pointer, and you'll see the different iterations. Another thing I wanted to point out is how site responsive um, I feel like it's important for my work to be. So you'll see a few things that you'll see again, um, like these flags, they play out different ways, different uh, presentations. Uh, so this is at Madison, I think I'm gonna switch to the microphone because I want to walk around. Hello? Yeah. So uh, at Madison, we had uh, the flags kind of set up in a way that felt like it was uh, like the UN. But what's nice for me, at least, is when you walk underneath it, it becomes this kind of animation. And so you go from uh, flag to flag, and they're all failed rocket launches and shuttle attempts throughout our space conquest history. Um, and so literally when you move through it, you jump backwards and forward through these different points in time. Um, and so I like this configuration. Um, so you see here, it was a totally different configuration where it encircled the, the gallery space, but here, I wanted it to be a kind of um, archway. And so you can play with different configurations. One of the things that I was often told was like, you make it and this is the way. Elizabeth Price, who's a, a um, artist out of Britain, <clears throat> talked about how, you know, she got the Turner Prize and was still recutting some of her like films um, in, the, in the gallery. And it it's doesn't ever have to be fixed. Uh, I made this all in Providence over in RISD. Um, I'd, I was invited to do some work and I uh, was playing and I thought they were terrible ideas, these um, hourglasses with these um, cavities uh, inspired by icebergs. It's called Indecisive Moments. And uh, I was interested in the sort of precariousness of uh, climate crisis. So they're filled with water and they become a, a sealed system. Um, and I made a collection of these, but I was literally like, this, when I was blowing the glass, I had them all in, in the trash. I was like, this is not gonna work unless you put them on top of each other. And I was like, this is a good idea. <laughs> and so I took them out of the, the trash and reconfigured it. Um, but they sweat, which was something, it was almost like a gesture where you regain time or that, again, this idea of time being outside of our, maybe not even outside, but contingent on our experience and that, that therefore, that it's completely subjective. So 
I, I thought there was a kind of terminus, this time has run out, but as they sweat, we regain a, a second chance. I was also interested in the, the distortion that happens when you look through the water and the glass. So the images uh, of like the way it, it reads changes depending on your perspective. That's a detail. Part of the exploration of time is about transit, you know, um, motion over distance. And I was thinking a lot about the borders and different borders. And I've used uh, chandeliers and light as a kind of stand in for humans and for um, force. And so this is called fathom, which is a unit of measure that is approximately, is six feet, but is suppose it's set up off of bodies. And this idea that we measure our deepest depths, we measure the ocean in body lengths. And then, you know, the connections to the cost of transit, the cost of migration, and the transatlantic slave trade all sort of just fell right in, you know, right into my ear. One of the things with um, this work is called T minus zero with these flags. There are moments that I remember and people from different eras remember whether it's the Challenger, Challenger or Discover. Um, and it's a, a kind of temporal landscape. You have these huge, huge clouds that stretch over miles and then they're gone. But in that moment, they're fixed in our, in our minds and our hearts for so long. So one of the things in Buffalo when I exhibited the work was going again into public space. Um, and this is the flags actually scaled up and then they were hung throughout the city of Buffalo. This is at a performing arts high school near the museum. I really like sometimes they just had no explanation and they were just on these poles, like a city hall, and then sometimes they were in connection to uh, the MIA flags or the American flag or local flags, which I, 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 or school flags. So it's always kind of an interesting combination. This is at the museum, University of Buffalo. I wanted to show you again a, a kind of iterative work. So this is called The Black That Birthed Us. And again, stepping outside of this um, kind of human-centered notion of time into deep time, um, this is a wheat paste that uh, initially started out as a flat wall and then became this room. And the two images that are at play um, one of them obviously is uh, uh, out of space, and then another is the Pruitt Argo um, housing development in St. Louis. And it was what we would call like the first project that was built. Um, it was a huge kind of failure of modernism. You know, everyone was like, this is gonna solve all our housing problems, and, um, and it'll be a great place. And it was segregated. So no black folk could live there. And then St. Louis realized it was a terrible place. And then they moved all their black people there. And one of the reasons why it was seen as a terrible place is because it was so isolated from the rest of the city. And it isolated people from each other. And so this is 1957. And so we knew that when we moved forward and started to take this model and disseminate it through cities throughout the country, um, so I always thought that was um, like baffling and uh, cruel. And so less than 20 years after it was built, it was demolished. And, and to take down for a municipality to acknowledge that we put all our resources into this thing and it is so terrible that we will now equal that amount of resources 
to admit and destroy it is kind of unheard of. It's like dams. Like once you build a dam, it's going to stay there until the absolute last moment. You know what I mean? And like cost 20 million to make, cost like 21 million to tear apart. So um, I was, uh, I like that part of what I'm talking about is this collapse of like the modernism and, and this human centric time can't describe human experience. It's, it's, it's the backbone of a lot of capitalism, but it's a sham. And so to put it directly in conversation with a time that don't care about us at all, like the time don't care about us, you know, we're a blip. We're like a blink of an eye's eye blinking. And so um, part of the installation you can see here are these photos and there's photos all over. And they're, again, moments in time, these um, anonymous photos that I get at flea markets, those are little intersections of time that I have with a person and then they're gone and they have lived their whole life. But I only saw that, that like snapshot of them, that f literal fraction of a second. And so, um, and then I went back on into uh, the pace of my life. So um, and this is it at uh, the, the Blanton in uh, Texas. This is the full exhibition. You know, there's some people, you think about them, or you say their name, and you can't not smile. You got that in your life? <laughs> One of those people is uh, Catherine Arline. She was my guardian angel. Um, and she passed, and when she passed, I uh, was really, so it was like an out-of-body experience. <clears throat> so this is a different body of work called Walk With Me. And we talk about being lost. And it was a moment of reconfiguration. Um, I had not worked in watercolors prior to her death, but I wasn't really able to do anything. So I was like, why don't you start working in this, this medium that you wanted to work in and weren't very good at? So I took a, one photo of her from 1956 when she first moved to New York and um, started painting it. It was her at 18. And I never knew that person, you know, like the same way, you know, my mom was always really good about saying, you know, I was 40 years old before you were born. And it's this reminder that for all my concern, for all my worry, like she had a whole life before I was even thought of being thought of. And now that I'm here, She's, she's still all right. And so a lot of times when I think about memorials and I make memorial work, it's about that gap that um, there's a world, as, while I'm going through all this pain, Miss Arline had a whole, a whole existence. You know, This is like a scared little girl from the South who moved to the um, projects of Brooklyn, who wanted to be in the big city and had just like made a decision and made that leap. And so over the next five years, I painted that one, I painted from that one photograph um, over 200 portraits. So that's what you were seeing. And part of it is a journey, a journey of, of um, grief. Part of it is a journey of commemoration you know, one of the things that come up in my mind a lot when I think about commemoration is whatever story I'm going to tell is going to be incomplete. And, and being okay with the fact that as we commemorate, we should know that we're not going to be able to get to the edges of an individual's life, you know. Um, and so I've, I didn't start out, I didn't start off thinking this is going to be a complete you know, 200 image um, testimony to her life. I just really thought this could be uh, a space that I could think with her. And then over the five years, there were things that I didn't like that I thought were terrible and ugly about 
the way I was coping with it and the, the images that I, would cre I was creating. Um, and I might have painted something. There were, there were images. I don't have any here, I don't believe. But there are some that, like this one I really, I, I love this one. They're all the same size, 11 by 14. For me, I feel like that's the last domestic size. After that, it gets into like posters, maybe 16, 20 might be. But then you get into like posters and then art with a big A. At 11, 11, 14, that's just in somebody's house, in somebody's barbershop. So um, one of the reasons why I like this one is because there's a vibration and it, it unnerves me. And there were images that I made that showed my anger. Like somebody I love, somebody that was like integral in my life was gone and I was not happy about it. And it was... You know, I might have made it in year one, and it wasn't until year three that I finally said, you know, I'm not going to tear it up, or I'm glad I didn't tear it up. And, you know, when I think about the, the arc and the, that path that I'm talking to you is about over five years, you know, <clears throat> I made them all over the world. It could fit in a suitcase. Like, this, this exhibition was... You know, I rolled up with like a rolling cart, and I was like, "Yeah, there's 200 paintings in here." And so there's a a way in which the mobility and the the being a migrative a a, mig a body of migration was being actualized. And that's before we start talking about the sort of formal qualities that, for me, um, are embodied in working in watercolor, which is so temporal. Like the line itself changes depending on how long you like leave it alone. The fact that what you see is never what you get because of the water content, um, and and there's a play in that that I I, I love to death. You know, um, I was telling a friend of mine that I I I don't say I'm not a painter. I don't really paint, and these are the things I like about watercolor. And he was saying that. It's really the performative nature of it, the way, you know. And when we get to the larger scaled work, you'll see that I'm working at scales up to eight feet. And so you have so much water, and you're pulling it, and you're waiting for a time when you can make another motion. Um, that I love that kind of dance. How are we doing? If there's anything that, it, like, you can come up at the end, but also if, if something doesn't make sense, just stop me. Um, anybody know what this is? I see somebody in the back. What's it? Were you raising your hand or you're just scratching your head? Oh, no, I was just scratching your head. Oh, <laughs> always get caught with that. <laughs> um... All right, I got another question for the crowd. Anybody see a movie called They Shoot Horses, Don't They? I see people shaking their heads. It's a, a movie about dance marathons from the 20s and 30s. And in the 20s and 30s, really in the 20s, there was a youth movement where people would dance as long as they could. And in the 30s, it kind of got weaponized or promoters so they can make money from it. And they started saying, well, you don't have to do recognizable dances. You, you stay as a couple, and we'll bring in performers on the weekends. And it went from 60 to 80 hours consecutively to five to six months consecutively. So you'd be out there dancing 24 hours, seven days a week for five to six months. And the winner gets a thousand dollars in the 1930s that was a lot of money <clears throat> but the real sort of meat of the the sort of platform was that you would um create these identities you would create these stories you'd come out and you'd sing a song for your for your sister who you know comes to this port and you haven't seen in years and people would throw down money people would get in rivalries have fake marriages you know does that sound familiar at all? Like all of reality television comes from this. Soap operas, from this. Elimination rounds, 
So they even had this thing where, <laughs> where you pay a nickel and you can watch them sleep. And so it's 90 minutes on, 60 minutes, I mean 90 minutes on, 15 minutes off, 60 minutes on, 10 minutes off. That's to go to the bathroom, that's to sleep if you want. Um, and then they did have elimination rounds where they'd have to sprint after like a month of dancing and cramping and jump hurdles, all kinds of different things. And so it's a pretty grotesque. And you would sleep, your partner would hold you, and then you know, then your partner would sleep, but you'd get your hair done, you'd shave, all in this public space, which at the time, you know, there's no big brother. So it's both sacrilege and just voyeurism. It's, I don't have it as bad as this, this person, but if they can keep going, then I can keep going. So it's this grotesque, complicated space that excited me. So I was thinking, well, how do I build this space? And I wanted it to be temporal. I wanted it to be something that was like kind of invisible, but it took up space. And so this is my favorite roller coaster in the world, the Cyclone. And it's not just because I'm from Brooklyn. Um, it was built in 1927. It's wood. If you wrote it in the 30s, you thought you were going to die because it's going to fall apart. In the 80s, in the 60s, whenever you wrote it, you thought it was going to fall apart. And it's been around through storms till this very day. And so um, I was also interested in how um, the buildings in, in my neighborhood, where in, across from my studio, fragmented bodies. And so... This is the first model, so I'm going to go fast through this because I'm kind of, uh, I'm still a shy person. You can be shy and be out there at the same time. <laughs> this I made uh, as the first model because um, somebody said I sounded very crazy in my description and it made no sense. Um, and then this is me taking over a classroom to start laying it out. And part of the thing is, you know, how do you go about making this thing that you never made before? Um, like I cut all the pieces individually and numbered them. Not a good idea. <laughs> At all. Um, and then these are early builds for the first one. They had to be room size because I wanted them to operate like architecture where a church is a church, say because of what happens in it. And if you stop doing church things in it, it gets desanctified. And so, and you see this um, throughout the global majority where you see objects, the life of an object is contingent on action. And so these, these platforms, these sculptures get destroyed if there's no programming. I'll take a sip of water. And this was my first uh, strength test. I was like, I don't know if it's going to hold people. <laughs> um, later, I would get better, and I'd sort of draw it on the floor, and I could build it. Um, and I went from you know, working alone and doing it over three to four weeks to being able to do them, do like twice the size in five days with one person. Um, there's a learning that happens. So I'd mentioned, uh, and this is one part of the dance marathon. So I had this work in my head. And I mean, I had this idea in my head for two years. And then I said, well, you keep thinking about these dance marathons. You got to start making work about them. So I, I did. And there's a strategy that I realized. Like, you know, I got a Mellon grant. Like Heather said, it's hard to get your projects funded oftentimes when you have a big project. So I broke it up into little projects. I've worked on this, this work for oh, 10 years now. And I've exhibited sections of it. I brought it all together. But it w I realized, like, oh, if you have a portion and that gets funded and you have another portion sort of modular, and again, it goes back to this, migrant modality that where 
if you're moving, if you can carry it, if you if it's um, f- like foldable, you know, again, like a, a, a module, then you can move quicker. Um, so this is, um, and also move all the places you want to go. Uh, one of the things that I do, I started to discover is like how much more build they would require. So you saw um, a small, po- you saw me standing on it, and I would do performances, so I program it. So that meant that there were poetry readings, there was going to be uh, dancers, singers, me. So, you know, it has to be able to have 600 pounds of dynamic weight. But then for this one, I had a, a dance troupe that was going to dance on it. And I had to paint it. And so you, you, f- you run into all of these different problems um, to think about how do you, you know, how do you spray a 35-foot sculpture, you know, to sp- you know, or how many coats are you going to take or how long. This is uh, extremely overbuilt, if, you've seen, if you have any sculptors here. And <laughs> when they were working with... Uh, the gentleman I was working with was saying, you know, it's really overbuilt. And I was like, yeah, because the dance company told me there was going to be two dancers at a time on it, which is, you know, 400 pounds of dynamic weight. I don't believe it. This is the final sculpture. At different points, there were 10 people <laughs> dancing on it all the time. And so there's a way in which I, I had this artistic idea but because I was making work that was functioning, I had to build in and think kind of in a way f- for so it would not fail. Um, and I think those part of the distance between the first one and this one is probably six six years. So when you see artists presenting work, there's a lot of R&D on the back end that I don't think People talk, artists talk about, uh, doesn't get talked about in academia, like my arts, my arts education so much, where you're like it just showed up and then we put it on the wall. It's like no, I built that first one. It took me so long. Painted it. Learned what kind of paints to use. So know that all of the bumps and and the time that you spend in the weed, all it it all has yield. This is the Margaret. Um, Margaret Jenkins Dance Company. This is one of the performances. Um, and then over the 10 years, these are some of the performances that I did where I realized these conversations of persistence and endurance that w- were um, embedded in the dance marathon exist in objects. So on one hand, I'm talking about this intangible space of action being a requirement for existence in an object, um, which I think is really digestible in an architectural context. But I think there are other spaces where people, especially in an art context, is sort of sacrilege, you know? Um, and so I went to different abandoned factories and businesses in Detroit um, where I was working, and we did a performance where this was the way I made it all the way through the space. So it's called um, Conspiracy of Good People. So when you walk in, that's all you see. Two couches, vertical, and a a chalkboard with a countdown. And then slowly over the next 40 minutes, all of this gets brought in, and there's a live performance. And that sculpture is the way that I made it through the space all the way around. It's about 5,000 square feet. And the title, and this is all in that sort of cluster of the dance marathon, thinking about persistence, endurance, identity. Um, and m- the phrase comes from the conspiracy of good people. My parents used to say this, you know, all the time. And partly because there's so many systemic racism and, and, and economic uh, uh, oppression that would happen in, in Brooklyn. There are forces that are out to get you. There are forces that are not welcoming of you um, and biases that you have to fight through all the time. But they're also a conspiracy of good people. 
like people who pick you up and take you when your mom got to work late, who teach you how to do things, who tutor you, who like put up with you when you were a brat. <laughs> and, and so at every juncture of achievement, I always feel like I'm riding with them. Like, you know, I love to make a list and I will not do it to you. But I always have a whole list. I love shout out tracks for that reason. A whole list of all the people who stayed late. And so acknowledging that conspiracy of good people that make it possible for me to stand here or for me to, you know, go to the school that I went to. This this was a uh, one quiet way of of understanding that persistence is a group effort, essentially. Um, Bam commissioned this work called Blind Sum in this same cluster. And the dance marathons were uh, segregated. So there was, there were whites only. And so I went looking to see if there was a, a version uh, in the black community and I didn't find any. And part of it, I believe, is because of a relationship to dance that African Americans had that was very different than white Americans. And also to be black in America in the 30s, it was an endurance contest. So you didn't have to create a construct. But what it, I started to be interested in was um, the everyday endurance tests and uh, that we overlook, like, um, you know, the education game, getting your kid into a good school in the city. Like, you know, you gotta figure this out and figure out what address you need to use and who's gonna pick them up, da da da. Um, and so these are all long exposure um, photographs um, that were taken in the uh, Bam Opera House in Brooklyn and in Detroit. And thinking about the everyday endurance that we just overlook or we don't even think about. Um, at the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, um, these were shown at life size or six feet. And so they became this space that you could walk into. Proximity, especially in this work, as, as I started to get the different modules, it was perfect for me because I could talk about the relationship to something I made year one with year five, whereas in year one I had it and it was just all in my head. So this is one of the larger um, sculptures. It's 35 feet and it goes from one room out into the next room through the wall. Sorry, I should not. It uh, goes out through the wall and um, into another room. It's the viewing space for the video that was shot on the uh, sculpture itself as its first action. Um, and I, I love to kick off the sculpture's life with an action, whether it's me or a performer that I'm filming. Um, and so this is a piece called A Faint Notion. Um, that's on my Vimeo. It's a little long for the lecture, but um, it was filmed during the time of the um, insurrection or protests um, that were happening in uh, Baltimore. And it's a kind of a re reverse erasure. Um, so yeah, how does it get made? So I come in and I, I was talking to Margaret Jenkins um, about the piece that I was making and it, it starts off like this. I'm never really wedded to the, the thing that I draw. I'm like, when I touch it, then it'll come to life. But this is, this is what I say beforehand. And you can even just even hear, see the little, the little differences where I'm like, oh yeah, this will come all the way out. No, this will get real flat. This will get flat. This is gonna get stumpy. Um, and then when it was all said and done, that like, uh, like this whole bottom piece was an addition. And so I'd been making these drawings since year one. And this is probably like year seven when you, the gold one. Um, and they became silk screens, three foot square silk screens. And what was nice is that potential, that space of potentiality was now 
manifested and their diagrams um, of possible spaces to explore these ideas. So where it's, where it's darker, it's higher, where it's lighter, it's lower. So these step down here and then pop up and I could really feel the reading it, I could feel um, the geography and the motion. And so I was excited and, and blessed to work with this uh, Andrew Peterson, this um, really amazing silk screen, silk screener? Silk screen printer. Um, and then this is some of the programming that you you would find on uh, sculpture. So the dance performance, this was a junior high school uh, fashion show. There's like all kind of drag, drag balls, poetry readings. Um, and then there were no more actions and then we dismantled it. And this is the exhibition. There was also another room. This is at Catherine Clark Gallery um, in San Francisco. And there was a room just dedicated to those sort of inaugural, inaugural gestures, those videos that were, um, that kicked each one off. And that brings us to what I'm working on now, North Star. Um, North Star is a multimedia project. It, it has four, four main components, uh, immersive video, it has a large scale painting, which is here, a short film, and a book. And it also seems like there's gonna be a symposium, which will be fun. So a lot of people talking about different ideas in their head. Um, and this is where I talk about that watercolor scale up. Um, I built this eight foot square table and it's nice to just play. So the work is exploring this notion or pushing against a notion of the black body as a station of trauma and that it is inherently a space of violence and that should be an expectation. So joy then becomes this temporary escape from that inherent state. So I'm proposing and picturing the black body in zero gravity, in a space of weightlessness. And that weightlessness is not a temporary space, but a space that's both permanent and inherent. So these are some of the large scale. This one is 83 by 79. Um, and part of it is like you just, I, I w didn't grow up seeing those kinds of presentations of me, of blackness. And I think it centers blackness, but it really talks about what is it to be un unbound? What is it to be in a, a constant state where you can't touch the edges? And so all of the work is looking to explore that. Um, this was this piece. If I have, you have, is um, comes out of a, an idea about cloaking, where so much of the time you cloak to survive, you hide, you find a way to assimilate or fit in, or so that you are less of a target. To be honest, and this cloaking also operates in a different way when you are home. It's kind of uh, osmosis. <laughs> so I got, a, I got a sister who tries to eat off my fork sometimes. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, that's not something you can't, what are you doing? And <laughs> the edge of me and the beginning of her, like there's no, when you home, somebody can eat off your fork. Somebody doesn't have to ask for permission. Somebody has memories that you can't access or you forgot. Const constantly you're reminded of who you are because of the people you love. So that leads me into, so cloaking that like camouflage is, is not only something that how you move through the world, but when you home, it's all one thing. You can't tell a difference between, you know, the sentence that you start and they finish. And they hold the memories. You know, you go home and they say, 
oh, you know, I don't like this. I don't like to eat that. Now, what are you talking about? You love this. And then you taste it and you're like, I, I, I do, I do kind of love it. And so that, that's this idea of a pluralistic self where the edges of our, you know, our fingertips and toes are not where we end. We're housed in all of these other entities. And even inside of our body, physically, there are all of these bacteria and, and things that keep us running um, and, and control our mood. And this is the we, the, the, the I that we talk about is already a, a position of, plur, of, yeah, a plural position. So this is a, a showing of some of the paintings at the Cleveland Museum of Art. So I wanted to create a context for the, for the paintings to exist. Um, so I did a immersive mural. They look little there. <laughs> In my studio, I was like, these are huge. They showed up, I was like, oh. That's nice. Um, this work, a lot of, and, and mainly talking about the paintings in part because of where I'm at in the, the I'm not a, a place that I can share sort of the other components. But um, I'm going to show you what I'm up to next month. So, I was talking about the conceptual space of being in zero gravity. And so now I'm gonna take, so, sorry, a group of people into zero gravity. So we're gonna, next mid April, so like in a month, we're gonna go up and it was astronaut training. So you can see here on this chart, uh, depending on the trajectory of the parabola, you get 30 seconds of weightlessness. And so we're going to see what that's like. And what does it really feel when you don't have the internal, like, those, those bounds that we constantly, of what our body is? Um, and historically, I'm also interested in, like, Okay, we talk about free market. There are instances where there was actually a free market. What did that look like? You know, there are other models of family. There's other models that exist. And so when put in a, a situation of quote unquote freedom, it never it never sounds, it never rings like what we imagine. So wish me luck. Thank you. Come on up for questions. Hey. Hey. Um, I love the expansiveness of your work. Like you have such a range in your practice. And I, I'm curious, like it doesn't feel like you're imposing limitations on like how you make or what you make. Um, can you walk us through, like does one project lead to the next essentially? Or do you like, where is the parameter in which you work? Do you have any? Thank you. Hi. <laughs> um, I do, the way I work is, is work on a kind of conceptual framework. And then this thing that I said a long time ago about Cassavetti and the way Cassavetti works, I was like, oh, I'm stealing that. It's my thought, I'm still stealing it. <laughs> it's um, an avalanche into a teacup. And so I have an idea, I had an idea about time. I was like, this time thing is bogus. And I was like, the time doesn't play out like that in my day-to-day -day life. It doesn't play out. It's been regimented, regimented for commerce. It's regimented for other systems that are not me and not the ones I love or the way I experience or move through the world. And so the different ideas that come up and with those different ideas, sometimes it's a, uh, you know, a lot of it is a listening. A lot, of, a lot of the parameters are being set, in my opinion, by 
what's the best material, you know, um, like uh, those icebergs, for instance. I spent like a long time making just trash. I was like, oh, I'll make it out of foam and then I'll cast it and I'll make this iceberg and it's too literal and it's not, and it's too, you know, beautiful. I'll, I'll cast it in aluminum and I'll buffer this and I can do this. And, you know, a lot of times, there are things that I don't really know how to do and I learn and I'm excited about that and there are things I can do really well. And sometimes the things you can do really well, you're like, I want to do that because <laughs> it'll look right. But it's not the right thing. So like the beauty of it is not necessarily your execution. It's the, the, the transit and the discovery. Um, and so... The, the parameters are constantly being set and and jiggled, you know. And then hopefully, that it, when you make that cluster, it has a gravity to hold itself together. Um, but you just gotta roll a dice. It's always an experiment. Like this could fail. Again. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so when you talk about endurance and persistence. Um, how do you know yourself enough in terms of how far you could push yourself? Because you were talking about 10 years in a project, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you can, you can elaborate or you can. I, I laugh because I don't really know, but a lot of So with the dance marathon piece, one of the performances I didn't show here was a piece where I danced from sunrise to sunset. Um, it was over 12 hours, and it was on the, the black platform with all of the rises and falls. And my best friend uh, asked him to DJ for me, and part of the reason, he was like, you know, I'm not really a DJ. And I was like, I have a feeling I'm gonna hurt myself, and I can't tell if my judgment is the best judgment, but I feel like you are confident to override me and also just to make a good, solid call. Like if I broke a finger, I could keep dancing. If I broke a leg, I probably should stop dancing. And I was like, I trust you for it. So I did the performance and it was fine. Like I cramped up, I had like, I lost a bunch of weight during it. I lost like all this water weight. Um, I was sad. Uh, I was real sad in the beginning. Nobody loves me. Nobody wants to dance with me. It's like people didn't want to wake up at six in the morning to come dance with you. <laughs> um, and so there, there, there's a discovery, and I'm excited for that. I don't really know. Like I didn't think it was going to be ten years in that. Um, I didn't think I was, was going to make two hundred paintings of Miss Arline. Um, it's just like you do it. You know, and so much of my career, people are like, so have you done that before? And I'm like, no, that's why, that's why I showed up. That's why I wrote that grant. That's why I like wrote the email and did that, all that unsexy work so that I could have new experiences. Um, and so, yeah, I'm always, I mean, even with the parabola, they were like, so, and I was like, have I done this before? <laughs> you know? So it's the gift. It's the gift that we get as artists, to be honest. And I don't take it lightly, and I, I ride with it all the time. Hi. Um, How I'm you doing? Good. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm really intrigued and excited about what you said um, about an object's life being contingent on actions. And I'm just wondering for you how far that principle extends. Like, Do your paintings require action to be given life? Um, or if it's really just sort of the 3D structures that you're building? That's a good question. I, um, I had someone very dear to me say, the things we don't touch die. And I kind of, I mean, to see those paintings is to, is to have action with them. But the ones that are, that are not around, I don't, I don't know. You know, like I... Painting is a relatively new space. Like I've been making collages for a long time and I will just, you know, open a box of collages I haven't looked at in three years and to see them, to like be with them and then put them back in a, a box because I don't have space or whatever the, the means are. 
Um, and as you get more successful, there are other lives. Like people take it and action it, you know. Um, so that's a, a question that is a, a real, a, a re, a checking in, constantly checking in with the objects and my feeling on them. So 200 made it from those paintings with Miss Holland, but some didn't make it. And I think that they're, you know, I mean, it's not great to say, but they're, they're works that I'm just like, that work can, can be dismantled, you know? Or, yeah. So I, I wouldn't say it's always the action, but some things, they die. And art is another one. I think commerce and the market try and preserve lives sometimes where they may not be there. Thank you. And they also extend them too. You know, we see something because people that's 4,000 years old in part because people have been wanting to be with it for 4,000 years. All right, last chance. Um, hi, Kimberly. How are you doing? <laughs> At the end, you were talking about I and we. And I'm very curious because I, I, seeing your work, you can tell there are a lot of hands have gone into it. And you're constantly talking about this, this group of people around you, whether it's people from the past and things they've said or people who are actually helping you make the work. Can you talk a little bit more about your community and how that's developed over the years? Yeah, yeah, I don't, there's always, I don't believe in this singular self. So, um, I mean, I, I, I could make a list. Steve McClure is the f like, first person who did watercolors that I was like, oh man, I love this, Steve. And then I did it, it was terrible. <laughs> and it would be, you know, ten, eight years later that I started making watercolors. It could be um, people who taught me how to, um, James McLeod, who taught me a little bit about glass and kind of got gave me the glass bug, and then Ben Wright, who you know showed me how to blow glass, and you know, and then slowly um, it becomes a part of the practice, you know, and that's in a very pragmatic way. Like these people gave me these skills, but then there are people who like pick up your call and talk to you about things when you don't really know, like um, for a North Star, I built a hologram. And <laughs> it was just like, build this hologram, hologram, I love this. And I talked to scientists, talked to people about it, and built it, and I was like, it's black people in a cage. I want this. But that was like eight months. And I was just like, mm, shut it down, <laughs> take a picture. <laughs> Just things that you could go back to, but it was so helpful talking to that same family of thinkers that sort of led me to the next thing, which was about custom-made prisms, and, and I actually worked with some people from RISD around custom-made prisms and how that spatializes video. Um, and so it's never a waste, you know, you know, those, those, I was like, those are conversations, but those people are the people who enrich your work for your, and your life, you know? Like, we get to put the thing on the wall, proverbially, but your, that whole journey it, it changes you as a person. And so, that's a gift. So that's, you know, that's that crew. Thank you guys for coming out. Enjoy the snow. <laughs>